and welcome to We on World is One. I'm Ghadi Francis and this is the West Asia Post, our weekly show where we bring you all the latest updates from the world's most volatile region. Since our last episode, a lot has happened in the region. Jordan has opened its main crossing with Syria. Its state carrier airlines are set to resume flights to Damascus after almost a decade. And the Syrian military chief paid a rare visit to Jordan. So it looks like Jordan and Syria are coming closer after years of fractured relationship. And as these two put aside their differences and continue to rebuild their ties, is this the beginning of the end of Syria's isolation? We tell you more. Since the last year, we have all been hearing about the winds of change in West Asia. The normalization deals were an example of the changing dynamics here. But it's not just Israel and the Arab world. Two other countries are putting aside differences in an effort to rebuild their diplomatic ties. For years, the relationship between Jordan and Syria was frosty. They were on opposite sides since the beginning of the Syrian war. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad allied with Russia, while Jordanian King Abdullah II sided with the United States. Mr. President, uh, Damascus you. had previously accused Jordan of training rebel fighters and allowing them to enter Syria through its border. Relations between the two countries degraded to the point where Jordan kicked Syrian ambassador Bahjad Suleiman out of the country in 2014. But now, a decade after the war in Syria began, the Hashemite kingdom is reevaluating those ties. Jordan fully reopened its main border crossing with Syria in a boost for their struggling economies hit by the pandemic. The Syrian-Jordanian border has been repeatedly closed since 2015. This was due to the presence of armed groups, especially around the border crossing point of Jab al-Nasif. For us Jordanians, we consider this crossing like the lifeblood of Jordan, as it is for the Syrians. So we consider this opening a very great thing, thanks to the efforts of the Syrian and Jordanian governments. We are entering Syria now as a Jordanian trade delegation to participate in the reconstruction of Syria exhibition. Although the Jaber crossing has been partially open since 2018, trade has yet to recover its $1 billion pre-war level. Before the conflict in Syria, the Nasib Jaber crossing was a transit route, with hundreds of trucks per day transporting goods between Europe and Turkey and the Gulf. The security situation is now stable on the Syrian side, according to sources, and we hope it remains stable. This was the reason behind the last closure of the Jordanian-Syrian borders. This will be cheaper for traders that if a Jordanian trailer just enters Syria than having two trailers and moving the goods between them. Now, one car can carry goods from Aqaba and enter Damascus. But that's not all. Jordan's state carrier will soon resume direct flights to Damascus. For the first time in nearly a decade, the latest step to restore extensive business ties with Syria. Flights have been suspended since the start of the conflict, even though other airlines continue to fly to Amman from Damascus. The visit of Syria's military chief general Ali Ayyub to Jordan marked a change in relationship between the two. The visit comes as Jordan sought to normalize ties with Assad, a strong reversal from the government's previous stance. Meanwhile, for Syria, the wider business links are crucial. It could help it recover from the conflict, attracting much-needed foreign currency. Jordan's normalization of ties with Syria is a part of a bigger Arab world push. 
to reintegrate a country that have shunned during its decade-long civil war. Jordan was hurt by the cutting of ties with Syria, and hosting millions of Syrian refugees has proven costly. But as Damascus continues to deal with the consequences of its war, it remains to be seen if Amman's gamble will pay off. West Asia Bureau, Weon, World is One. Polls in Iraq on October 10 are a major reaction to the protests that rocked the country in 2019. There's little evidence that the vote will make things better, but many are calling it an election that holds a key role to Iraq's future. With growing anti-government protests in the country and the United Nations team that will monitor the elections, what will this mean for Baghdad? War-scarred Iraq is all set for elections next week. But for the citizens of the country, the polls have become more about politicians and less about the change they will bring in. Iraq is emerging out of two decades of war. The country has experienced insurgency since the U.S.-led invasion toppled dictator Saddam Hussein. This was followed by a brutal war to fight off the Islamic State. It ended in 2017, but was followed up by years of corruption and conflict. In the last two years, protests against the ruling elite have rocked the war-torn nation, killing hundreds. The polls were initially scheduled for 2022. They were earlier moved forward to June this year, but later postponed to October. The early polls were a concession to the anti-government protests. Nearly 25 million Iraqis are eligible to vote. They will elect 239 lawmakers from more than 3,200 candidates in 83 constituencies. A 25% quota is reserved for women in the Council of Representatives. Although parliamentary polls are being held early, there is little hope for major change. The reason for this is widespread disillusionment. The people of Iraq view the political class as inept and corrupt. Most of them don't even want to vote. Fears are that the voter turnout could drop below the official 44.5% in 2018. Most people have a feeling of despair regarding the elections, despite their demand for an early election. However, they feel that the situation before these elections is not what they had asked for. It doesn't feel safe and the activists feel that they may be killed, arrested or even unable to participate in the elections the way they wanted to. Some politicians say that Iraq is moving forward. The election is being held six months early. There is a new law to help independent candidates. Violent sectarianism is less of a feature and security is better than it has been for years. For some citizens, this is not the reality. The polls are a contest, dominated by groups, especially those that control state bodies and resources. Many say that the political factions are the same since 2003. The only thing that has changed are the faces. There are problems in the country that make elections undemocratic, such as weapons outside the control of the state, there will be no transparent elections and I do not want to be complicit in this crime. I consider this election a crime. We do not know what the solution is because all the roads are blocked. Shiite majority groups are expected to remain in power. This has been the case in the war-torn nation since Saddam Hussein's Sunni-led regime was removed from power. But the Shiites are also sharply divided. The reason is Iran's growing influence. Shiite groups backed by Iran are facing off at the polls against other Shiite groups that oppose Iran's influence. Activists who took to the streets during the protests are also split among themselves. While some are boycotting the election, others are taking part. If we know that continuing to protest would bring the current system down, we would continue to protest. We are protesting peacefully. We don't mind. 
But when we protested, they killed us, arrested us and maliciously charged us. How do we achieve change? We need to be present at decision-making levels. Popular resentment over corruption and lack of public services is pushing more and more Iraqis to migrate to the West. While the 2019 protests led the previous government to quit, little else has changed since then. The elections are taking place at a time in Iraq when politicians, groups and communities are more fractured than ever. This vote's aftermath will set the tone for the coming years. Will the country usher in a new ruling class or will the same political groups wield power in the war-torn nation? West Asia Bureau, we own World is One. Like always, we will continue to bring you all the latest updates from the heart of the conflict. But first, let's take a look at what else is making the headlines across West Asia. Dubai's Expo 2020 opened for visitors, during which the UAE hopes to welcome about 25 million guests. It is considered to be the largest global event since the start of the pandemic. Bahrain hosted the Israeli Foreign Minister Yair Lapid in the highest level visit since the country's established ties last year. This comes as the kingdom's Gulf Air launched direct flights to Tel Aviv. Over 130 people have been killed in two days in Yemen as the Houthi rebels clash with the Saudi government forces, all in a bid to capture the last government bastion of Marib. In his first address at the UN General Assembly, Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett said that Iran had crossed all red lines in its nuclear program. Iran's nuclear weapon program is at a critical point. All red lines have been crossed, inspections ignored, all wishful thinking proven false. Vowing that Israel would never allow Tehran to acquire a nuclear weapon. Qatar will host its first ever Formula One Grand Prix in November at the Lozere International Circuit. The Gulf nation has also signed a 10-year deal to host Formula One from 2023. The United States has issued Hezbollah-related sanctions in coordination with Qatar. According to the U.S. Treasury, the coordinated measures will target major Hezbollah financing networks in the region. West Asia is no stranger to climate change, but the region is not doing enough to tackle it. There's lack of cooperation between the nations, and climate change seems to be missing from the agenda of every summit. While West Asia is running out of water and is slowly becoming inhabitable, when will West Asian leaders realize that the time to act is now? Where we're standing right now should be a river. You can tell. Iraq's once swirling Sirwan River has dwindled to a trickle. The reason? Climate change and Iraq's neighbor, Iran. And this water is completely being controlled by Iranian dams and uh, without actually um, even we, we don't even know when they release the water. The Sirwan River begins in Iran and runs along its border with Iraq. It then flows into Iraq's Kurdistan before joining the Tigris. While the water level here was once abundant, it is now dotted with measuring levels, marks which show where the water once reached. As a heat wave baked the region in July, the situation got much worse in Iraq. The country was running out of water, with upstream neighbors worsening the water flow. In reality, as we know, this year was a year of drought. There was no rainfall, meaning less rainfall, and high temperatures. So the decrease in water coming from neighboring countries became evident for us Iraqis. 
Iran and Turkey are building big dams to solve their own lack of water. But regional cooperation on the issue is patchy. Iraqi officials say that Tehran is diverting parts of the Sirwan back into Iranian lands. But without any agreement with Iran, the situation is likely to worsen. Iraq's water crisis has been in the making for nearly two decades. Outdated infrastructure and short-term policies made Baghdad vulnerable. For war-scarred Iraq, the climate crisis is the next great threat. As Iraq bakes in the blistering summer heat, its farmers and livestock herders are battling severe water shortages. Shortages are killing their animals, fields and way of life. The oil-rich country is one of the world's most vulnerable to climate change, struggling with a host of other environmental challenges. At the Baghdad summit in August this year, West Asian countries discussed regional cooperation, but the issue of regional water policies was not on the agenda. For now, the consequences could be dire. Areas could become uninhabitable, tensions over water sharing could rise, and political violence could erupt over water. West Asia has witnessed persistent drought over the years. Sometimes temperatures are so high it could become uninhabitable soon. Add climate change to the bag and the future of water here is as grim as ever. West Asia Bureau, we on World is One. Refugee puppet Amal is on a journey from Syria to Europe. The 11.5 feet puppet represents the story of a Syrian girl. As it travels a distance of almost 8,000 kilometers, the journey of hope called The Walk aims to highlight the stories of refugee children. We take a look. Meet little Amal. A giant refugee puppet on an epic journey from Syria to Europe. She is traveling almost 8,000 kilometers to change the narrative about refugees. The 11.5 feet giant puppet represents a nine-year-old refugee girl on a journey. She is in search of safety and her mother, who never returned from her attempt to find food. Her journey of hope is called The Walk, a move to highlight stories of refugee children. Amal is a nine-year-old girl. The first time we were inspired by a little girl we met in the jungle in Kalias in 2015 during the migration crisis. This child had moved us because she passed from arm to arm. We all surrounded her, but she had lost her mother. Amal is made out of lightweight materials such as cane and carbon fiber. It allows people to operate it for extended hours, taking almost four puppeteers to bring Amal to life. One on each arm, one supporting her back, and one inside walking on stilts. The fourth puppeteer also controls the harp, a complex tapestry of strings that animate her face, head, and eyes. We are artists, so we create emotion, empathy to try and make things change, that's for sure. We call on children from all over the world to write letters for children like Amal and that we will bring to the European Parliament. And in association with the La Monnaie Theatre, those letters will be brought to the European Parliament. We use the tools we have, which are images, beauty, art and different communities. Here are some numbers that highlight only a part of the Syrian refugee crisis. More than 12 million Syrians displaced from their homes. More than 6.6 .6 million have been forced to flee the country. Another 6.7 million Syrians remain internally displaced, with many living in refugee camps across Syria. Their existence is even more precarious. Amal basically follows a migratory route of 2015. She goes through Turkey, Greece, Italy and France. A little detour to Switzerland to visit the UN before ending her journey in the United Kingdom. Amal's journey is a unique one. It highlights the plight of the Syrian refugees, but also shines a spotlight on their potential. West Asia Bureau Beyond World is One. There can be different kinds of art in the world. What is art to you 
may not look very artistic to me. But this Saudi businessman has developed a unique interpretation of art. He says he's producing live art by crossbreeding pythons. Yes, you heard that right. He's breeding giant tricolor snakes. We tell you more. Saudi Faisal Malaika's love for snakes began when he was just five years old. Now the 35-year-old is crossbreeding pythons, a bid to produce live art in unique colors and pattern. In the garden of his palace in the Red Sea city of Jeddah, the businessman has what he calls the snake room. In here, there are over 100 reticulated pythons, the world's longest snake and a species native to South Asia. There are people who collect precious stones or classical cars or paintings. As for me, I like to collect live art. The creatures slither around in large glass encased boxes. All the boxes in the air-conditioned room have holes. Just big enough for them to flick their tongues out. Sawdust lines the floor of these boxes, absorbing odors from the snakes' droppings. What I do here is crossbreed to produce rare genetic mutations with patterns and colors unseen before. Crossbreeding pythons takes time and patience. It takes about three to four generations and about 10 to 12 years to produce a tricolored snake. But Malaika says he has no interest in selling to fashion brands. I do not agree with the exploitation of these animals for financial gain after they have been killed. I love the snakes alive. As I've been saying from the beginning, I consider them a living art. Malaika has spared no expense in taking care of these snakes. He brings in specialists from the United States to learn more about crossbreeding and mutations. Most of the snakes are worth between $200 and $20,000 each. But it's living with these widely feared creatures that is a dream come true for the Saudi businessman. West Asia Bureau, we own. World is one. That's all we have for you on this episode of the West Asia Post. I will see you next week with a brand new lineup, bringing you more stories from the world's most volatile region. Until then, stay safe. I'm Radhi Francis, and you're watching We On World is one.